Hello. Quiet, everyone. Take your seat. We're going to get started. So thanks for coming out tonight. I'm Lara, and this is the one of the events from the Writers Guild Brooklyn, which is an event created by the Writers Guild East. And I'd like to thank Dana Weissman, Jason Gordon for all of their efforts. And without further ado, I wanted to say we're very excited about Sweet Bitter tonight. And um, before we get started, the format is that we're gonna show a few clips and talk to the writers and creators of the show. And um, to introduce everything, I'd like to bring up Logan Hill. Thank you. Show you, oh, I should use this one here. That one was on my chair. Yeah. Hey, everybody, I'm Logan. Uh, I'm an arts journalist. I've been in the city for a long time. Uh, places like New York a Magazine and the New York Times, where I met Stu Zickerman, the showrunner tonight. Screen and talks. New York Times. Screen talks, right? <laughs> Yes, I host a new series called Screen Time, so if you like going to events like this, uh, we're spinning it out of our Times Talk series, and I'll be hosting uh, screening once a month, thanks for the reminder, um, with Q&As afterwards. Um, today, we'll talk about 45 minutes up here, and uh, then we'll, ask, we'll pass around a mic so you can ask some better questions than the ones I'll ask. Um, but without further ado, let's introduce uh, the creator, novelist, and uh, she was in the room too, Stephanie Domler. We've got Liz Tuchello, Kenneth Lynn, AZ Dungy, and showrunner Stu Zickerman. Um, we're going to be talking a bit about food and writing and food service and writing. Um, I used to work, I've only ever really been paid for two things. I think it's sort of waiting tables and, and writing. Um, how many people here are writers who have also made money at some point bartending or waiting tables or sh cooking? Like, like that's actually fewer than I, I thought. Maybe. You didn't say what bartending. Oh, or bartending. What did you guys, the rest of you do to make money? <laughs> <laughs> Copywriters all Oh, <laughs> forgot about that. Tutors. Um, uh, but I, I thought, for a little icebreaker, if you could each tell us a little bit about some other projects you've worked on, how you got here tonight, and then if you had a royalty check, if you got an unexpected fat royalty check come in, uh, what meal would you spend it on here in New York? So, I wrote a book called Sweet Bitter. I have been talking and living inside that book for five years and I've done nothing else. Um, <laughs> So before that, I worked in restaurants. And I think I would head to Gramercy Tavern. Um, I, what, the question was, what else have you worked on? Or? Yeah, yeah, give us a little brief 10-second brief intro. Okay, um, Name check a few things. OK, so before, I, um, before a Sweet Bitter, I spent four years in a pressure cooker called House of Cards. Um, and if I had my last meal in New York City... Well, not last. Oh. That was not the question. Oh, really? <laughs> so that's where I go to. Too, I'm the drama guy on that. Um, too many years on House of Cards, man. It's the scarf. <laughs> what about raising the stakes? I, I'm just going to Popeyes. That, 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 that's it for me. Yeah. Um, I am, my name is Liz Tuchillo, and um, I get... I guess I would be say I would have been a part of the HBO family with um, Sex in the City and then Divorce, I guess. And and uh, I really I really enjoy a lobster roll. So I think if I had like if I starved myself, I would eat many lobster rolls because they're not cheap. You know what I mean? Even the ones in the little shacks, they're not cheap. So that's what I would do. Do you have a favorite spot? Is there the favorite I am, spot? I enjoy the Luke's Lobster, which they're so expensive, it's insane. But then I also found a way that if you buy the lobster meat and then you just put butter on it, it tastes exactly the same way. <laughs> Why am I talking about this? Okay. Hi, I'm AZ, um, and I 
am a fourth year writer on Kimmy Schmidt, Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt. Oh, yay. Um, let's see. And this is my second job ever. <laughs> um, and let's see. If I had all the money in the world. Well, okay, here's the problem. I have a lot of food allergies. <laughs> We've all been rewriting So there's the not much that I can eat. No. Um, but there's this little, uh, little, pretty little restaurant in Brooklyn called Henry's End. And every year they have a wild game festival. <laughs> And I really enjoy wild game, so I would probably just go back there and eat lots of wild game. <laughs> what's like the wildest game? Like, what's how wild does it get? Um, well, the last time I took my sister, and she had duck uh -huh. with like cherry tart cherry sauce, I think, and I had elk fillet. Okay. Um, there was rabbit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there were. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. All right, Stu. Uh, the last couple of years, I've been uh, lucky enough to work on uh, the, uh, the Americans um, and the Affair and um, Divorce and uh, a show called Divorce. And, um, <laughs> and that sequence does usually go together: Affair yeah. then Divorce. Yes, <laughs> there's a theme here. Um, uh, and yeah, they made a little show in the middle called Mating. Um, <laughs> But, uh, and if I had a big royalty check, I would buy that, uh, that new uh, hand roll bar at the city point in the food court. Have you seen like the sushi hand roll bar? Where is it? Hand roll? I would buy that. I'd buy the whole thing. <laughs> Thanks for indulging my icebreaker. Um, uh, Stephanie, uh, I know you've asked a whole, but you've been asked this question over and over and over again. This kind of like, how much of you is in this book? Um, you know, you have to remind people it's not, it wasn't a memoir, it's oh, a novel. I ha no, I know. Yeah. It's it's seventy six point three four percent of me, <laughs> and the rest is total fiction. So that's easy now right. that I've done figured that out. <laughs> and you want to tell us a little bit about the experience of of uh, you, you'd said. The going in to pitch this book originally was a little that, that your skills that you picked up in the restaurant industry sort of equipped you for dealing to some extent with what it's like to pitch a book. Well, I think that having only worked in restaurants my entire life, when I came into these publishing meetings with these conference rooms full of people, what I realized is that I had been training to walk into a room of strangers and read them, anticipate their needs, put everyone at ease, but also be myself. And what a skill set. I mean, it's people. It's reading people. It's taking care of people. And it worked out all right. What I was really preparing for all those years was building the set and <laughs> realizing another full restaurant. And so, so is, this, is the idea of this becoming a television series arises, how, how does it come together? Were you out pitching it to all kinds of places? Mm. Stu, when do you get involved? Break it down for us. Hmm, how does it arise? Well, as the author, you have a choice whether you're going to option the book and kind of give it away and get back to writing books, which is what most people do. But I had a team behind me that believed that I could transition in the screenwriting and producing. And so we started to take meetings and the very first person I met with, and it was like 30 meetings, it was just a gauntlet, was Stu Zickerman. Take it away, Stu, what happened next? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I had never really worked on someone else's show, you know, in this capacity. And, um, but when I read the book, um, you know, when I first was given the book, I thought, oh, a restaurant show, people have tried this before, and um, it doesn't really work, but then I started reading the book, and, um, and by page 10, I was, you know, um, already thinking, I mean, she made such a, a smart decision to set the, sh uh, the book and, and the story um, at the best restaurant in New York, um, and so there were no stakes to the actual restaurant. You know, every restaurant show, it's always been, you know, can we stay open? There's no stakes to, like, you know, can we get an A rating? Can we make the best salmon? You know, like there's no, there's no stakes for a show in that. Um, but because everyone worked in the best restaurant at the time in New York, um, 
the stakes were all about the characters and can you fit in here and can you survive here and um, and I just thought what a great platform for a TV series and um, I remember saying to Stephanie you know um, be careful you know there may come a day where um, you know you walk on set and there's 250 people working and um, or like they cover subway trains and and with your show and you know it, it, it it's all you enter into this, it could all really happen, and, um, and here we are. Uh, was, what worked in that meeting? What, 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 uh, what made that meeting different from the other ones? Well, <laughs> besides undeniable natural chemistry, obviously, <laughs> um, I really trusted him. I loved that Stu was from New York. I had everyone I met with after that was an LA-based showrunner or producer, and the way that people talk in Hollywood at that time was very jarring to me. Now I'm used to it, but, um, and I also sensed that Stu was a teacher. I think that I had an instinct that I was going to be partnering with someone that was going to be patient enough to teach me instead of just taking the script and being like, oh my God, I can do this myself in two seconds. I sensed from him that he would grow, help me grow, and grow with me, and I was right. And I mean, I'd be interested in hearing you discuss how the writers' room was put together and how you decided to continue to be a part of it and what your role was, sort of, in the project going forward. That was never like that was never even part of the equation. She was always, you know, I mean, from the beginning we talked about, you know, and I said I when I first met her, I I thought both the way she writes and the way she writes dialogue and the book and and um, just her personality that she would fit into a writer's room and and um, and so she you know you need you need someone that is willing to dive in you know in the way that um, it takes you know and so Stephanie was in every you know read every sample was in every writer's meeting we put together you know what I really think is the single best writer's room I've ever been in you know um, that ran you know, and she was in the room for every minute of it, and and um, and and learned, and, and from people with experience and different. You know, we we put a staff together of people from different genres. You know, from House of Cards and um, Sex and the City and, and Kimmy Schmidt. Like it's, we really aimed to put, to put together um, a room full of people that could um, bring what you find in a restaurant, which is all walks of life. You know, in any, um, we used to joke about, like, really, in any one night of service in a restaurant, you have high drama, comedy, flirting, you know, tragedy. You know, you go from one minute where you think it's all just fucked to the next minute where you're like, I'm going to, you know. And, um, and so I, there was never a minute where she was not going to be part of it. Yeah, I think that I definitely, like, thought perhaps I should pull back and just focus on my books. And then I thought, how often in life does someone offer you a free education? These brilliant people are willing to work with me and teach me how to make television? Like, duh. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a few appetizers for you. Uh, we have a few clips from the show. Um, we'll show you one that gives you a sense of like what the restaurant, the world of the restaurant is like. Yeah, we'd love to show you guys the whole show, but unfortunately, um, it's coming out. Uh, it has not premiered yet. It's premiering next week at the Tribeca Film Festival, and therefore, we're not allowed to show you the whole show. But we've got some clips uh, that we'll talk through, and, and the first two clips are from the pilot, and the others are from... We'll roll the first clip. You done primping? Ah, uh, primped. <laughs> Follow me. And don't touch anything. Don't talk to anyone. Don't do anything unless I tell you to. Okay? The first thing is you're going to be fucked on bar mops. There aren't enough. I'm not going to tell you where I hide mine. So if you see one, you grab it. You got it? Got it. Bar mops. Oh, my name is... I know who you are. Don't forget to clock in. 
I haven't had a trail in over a year, but here goes, okay? 49% of this job is shit anyone can do. You study the menu, the ingredients, their sources, table numbers and positions, they're in the manual. You learn it, you love it. This is pickup station, bread drawer, hotline, cold line, pastry, that's the meat locker. There's a dead pig in there, just FYI. This is butcher. Uh, that's dry storage back there. This is hot, just don't touch it. This is Raven, he's a nasty freak. Uh, we have our own specific mise. Not full on French, but you don't let the water levels drop, but you don't spill. Howard will let you taste a seared foie gras, but he goes crazy over the fucking linen bills, okay? This is dirty linens, and this is where you came in. Hey, hands out of your mouth. The rest of what? The job. You said all this is 49%? Oh, 51%. Taking care of people. That's the hard part. Let's go. You miss family meal, you don't eat. It's true, Jeff called her a fag. And I was like, I don't want to be a lawyer. So what, now it's like, you jazz Yeah, the that's true. I feel great all the time. I swear to God, if one more person asks for fucking snake sauce. But I never sleep anymore. You texted Bellevue and you remember this. She's like 17. I'd fuck the mom. I just stopped inviting and where are the treats? None for you. No, 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 no. You, you're on salt shakers. Yeah. You just, you fill up, you, uh, you wipe down, you dry off. Easy enough? Treats. Oh, wow. Thank you. What is that? Who's brave enough to begin? Is it off? No, it's just old. It's old world for sure. It's Pinot, obviously. It still smells like wet socks. Those are actually your socks. No, I think it's pork. <laughs> no. It's perfect. What a treat, Howard. The Gevray Chambertin, the Armand Geoffroy, the uh, 2000 vintage. It's tricky. The rains in September interrupted the harvest all over Burgundy. It's a disaster for some, but Cote de Nuit fared well. Olives. The rain gives you black olives on the nose. Thank you, Simone. <laughs> Friends, I did not open a $200 bottle of wine purely for Simone's pleasure. <laughs> This wine is a steal, but it is also a gift. Share it with your guests tonight. Have good service. Hey, Howard. Wow. Yeah. Here you go, kid. This is a bus stop. Bus it. So that's from the first episode. I realized that we didn't really set up exactly the fact it's six episodes, six half hour episodes, and you guys kind of have to move quickly establishing this world. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit about all of you, sort of how the pilot came together and what your goals were in, in the pilot? Yeah, I'll take it. Um, I think pilots are about world building and the introduction of the major characters, but I think what we were trying to do is immerse people in this restaurant as quickly as possible. And this family meal scene, well, those two scenes back to back give her an idea of the pace of this place and the codes that they speak in and that there's a sort of family or brotherhood that she can't penetrate. And the other goal, I mean, watching this, what I'm really proud of is the restaurant authenticity 
There was so much work that went into training the background extras in the kitchen for that walk and talk scene. They went to two weeks of training at a culinary institute downtown. Every single one of them knows how to hold a knife. They know how to move. They know how to prepare their dishes. And that looks like, I've worked in restaurants my entire life. The actors that too. looks like a restaurant. The actors too. Oh yeah, the actors too. But they're not as much fun as the background people. <laughs> you know, we had this, we had a very unique situation. I mean, because of the success of the book, stars, when they picked the show up, um, you know, said basically like, we have a release date of May 6th, 2018. How many episodes can you make by then? And we were like, six, you know? I mean, normally you wouldn't make a six episode um, for a season. And, and um, so we all talked a lot about you know, how do you do this? You know, how do you, you can't take a big bite out of the book in, in, for, in a first season. And, and we all first got in the room, we talked about, you know, um, basically the mandate from stars was to make these six episodes almost like a pilot, right? Like a three hour pilot. And so we paced it, you know, and it's cable, so you don't have to like feel obligated to get to certain beats and moments. And um, we did, we paced it. You know, this pilot episode is Tess's first day, you know, and, and it's all about just literally trying to survive that first day. And, um, and that family meal is literally not just what she's up against in terms of the pace and, and all, but um, this is a girl, when you watch the show, you'll see it's a, it's a girl who's come to New York without anything. She's never belonged to anything. When you walk into a family meal like that, you see all these people that know each other, and you're gonna see another clip later on of what they're all like outside of the restaurant, you know? You want to belong. It's like this, this, if you've never belonged to something in your life, and um, when you work in a restaurant, there's a family element, just like there is on a TV show. You know what I mean? Um, so the challenge of this and, and the arc of this first season um, was to really write something that has six parts to it, but feels like one story of a, of a pilot. I'm curious to hear from all of you in the room. You know, were there were there moments where you thought this is just too much story? We've got it. We've we initially had ambitions that were bigger, and then you realize, okay, that's too much to be contained in the six episodes. What what were the that that feeling like? Because there's a lot of characters you've got to introduce very quickly in the first couple of episodes alone. You mean is there that we were creating too much story that it wouldn't we couldn't fit in six? Yeah, I, I guess I'm curious. Yeah, because you're clearly carving out a you know, piece of the series, but it's not that kind of 13 episode or 20, like kind of big long arc that you're working on. I don't know, I, you know, I just, I'm curious how that changes. I feel like, I don't know for anybody else, but for me, the, the and not a worry, but the sort of a curiosity was that we took our time, Stu and Stephanie really wanted us to take our time with story. So it was more like, you know, this word you hear all the time now is loud, like the shows have to be loud to get eyeballs. So. This is not a loud show. Uh, it's only loud in the detail and the immersiveness of the world, but it's not, you know, not, there's, not, there's no explosions or there's no whatever. There's no crazy cliffhangers. So that was more the... the Way to sell it, Liz. What? <laughs> <laughs> we were worried there was going to be really boring. Emotional no. explosions. <laughs> no, 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 but I mean, so the more the, cons not the concern, the, the curiosity is like, will people be interested in a sort of nuanced, subtle, sophisticated story that wasn't fast, fast, fast? Right. And, and I think we were all in the room very much in love with this book. Um, so that, that was really challenging for me. And if you guys haven't read the book yet, please go read the book, because I think it's one of the great I books. I paid them to see um, that, <laughs> And so for me, it, that was the hardest thing, of like, how do we capture this thing that is really brilliant into these 30-minute you know, slots? Um, and, and eventually, we had to say, OK, well, we just have to tell the story for each particular episode and not try to completely recreate the ethos Yeah, we also chose novel. a point of view, too, because I mean, we, in the first week in the room, we put all the characters up. And there's a lot of detail from all the characters um, from the book, and then you know we all talked a lot about what do you imagine for this character? What's what's things that are not in the book that we could do with this character? And we we put them all up on the wall, and we, we looked at all these things, and we're like, we can't come close to telling all of this story. And it's why we decided in season one that we would just stay with Tessa's point of view mm -hmm. um, and not try to 
sort of bite off telling an A story for this character and a B story for that character, and we <coughs> everything's through Tess's point of view. And I know you said that that point of view is, is sort of intentionally blank in the beginning, or at least her sense of her backstory and history, that you withhold a lot about that character in the beginning. And in the pilot, too, we don't, we don't exactly know why she, comes, she arrives in New York. We don't hear about the details of her biography in, until they're sort of meted out very carefully. Yeah. Um, I think it's very true of the New York experience that when you arrive here, you get to start from zero that you kind of leave your past at the gate. It's also very true of my experience in restaurants that everyone's an orphan from either metaphorically um, or estranged from family in some way and looking to create a new family structure. And so we don't need backstory to tell us that, I don't think. I think it's a convention and with the book, I was pushed several times to give her more backstory, begged by some editors. And I was like, I don't want to justify what she does in the present tense with some boring story from her past. I think we, she's a present tense creature. That's what we know about her. She's chosen to pack up her things and move to New York City, that, knowing no one. That decision alone tells you tons about a character. We can see a little bit more of her. We have another clip also from that first episode. Yeah, this is the very end of the pilot um, when um, yeah, she gets her first taste. I was looking for me? No. I mean, not not you. Just I was gonna do those. What did you and Mrs. Neely talk about? How does everybody look maybe it was wrong and I'm sorry, but stop apologizing. I'm sorry, but is a meaningless sentence. Okay. I'm not sorry. The woman is lonely. Do you know something about being lonely? You don't know me. I know a little. You took this job because you thought it would be easy. Fast money, safe place to wait. You have gotten by on your charm for so long that you haven't developed a character. But that won't work here. I'll be back to whatever sad story you came from in a week. You will have missed the opportunity to become a person. I meant what I said. Pay attention. It's not just salt. Oysters? I don't know. How did you even learn how to do that? I was like filthy. They're a secret. A leap of faith. Take it quickly. Salt. 
I taste salt. This idea, that there's a character that says, you will develop a palate, right? And this idea of taste and of her sort of finding that she has certain tastes, finally she has certain appetites, distinguishing between what she likes and doesn't like becomes a theme to the show. Curious, um, AZ, you want to talk about what that, that meant to you uh, in terms of <laughs> that handle on her character? Finding a palate, yeah. what do you mean? Um, well, I guess for me coming into this, it was like uh, I, I remembered coming to New York for the first time, um, or coming to live for the first time, which was, I went to NYU, so I came here to go to college, and I was pretty green. I mean, <laughs> even my grandmother who lived in Queens called me green, it was that bad. <laughs> um, and so this story was uh, very familiar to me in a lot of ways about sort of being thrown into a big city and, um, you know, something so different from where you're from. And it's like every new experience um, is like a, an awakening experience. And so, um, you know, the show I'm writing on that's a comedy is Kimmy Schmidt, and she also is coming here <laughs> from Indiana. And, um, but of course we take that very, uh, you know, it, there's a lot of, of satire that comes with that and it's a very fast paced show and it's very um, it's very goofy and silly so it was really nice to take a very similar type of character and experience um, but to be able to dive into it more deeply and to take the time to watch somebody um, I don't know I, I often thought while we were making this that people love to watch people eat like, we're like obsessed with watching people eat, you know? And, and it's not just watching them eat, but it's that first experience of tasting something new. You know, we watch all these shows where, what's that guy that eats like weird stuff all around the world and stuff. I'm like so fascinated by it and I'll never taste it. But just being able to, to see somebody experience something for the first time, um, there's something, there's so, there's so, there's something so like, uh, deeply human about that and sensual in a real, like, I don't know, um, basic way, I guess. Um, and now, I, you know, so I felt like this story, it was, it was fun to, to, to write somebody experiencing all those new things in that way. Yeah, and the notion of developing a palate is not, <clears throat> we talked about it a lot as not being specific to food. You know, it starts like as the first taste of an oyster, but you know, and if, if um, you know, um, uh, you know, taste is sense memory. It, it, it's if you eat an oyster and you, um, you know, but you've never been to the ocean, you've never been to the beach. You don't. You have a different experience of tasting it than someone who, um, you know, knows what it's like to have salt on your on, on your body or, or feel salt in your hair. Or, you know, and. Um, and that relates to so many things, because we talked about it as um, this season will be her first oyster, but also her first taste of irrational lust, you know, of um, the, the desire to belong to something. So, like, you know, it's, it's the palate is not just about food, um, especially for a character like this who's not been exposed to, to so many things, you know. What's interesting, I w was just thinking about this, watching it now, is that it wasn't in the first dozen drafts of the pilot. I remember I was with Stu and our partners at Plan B, and we were going over yet another draft of the pilot. And Jeremy asked, what are the scenes that people want to see? And I was like, well, the oyster scene, but that will be like 10 episodes in. Like, we'll have to build to that. And I think it was a process for me of, first of all, letting go of the book which the sooner I got into that headspace, the better for the whole project. And also realizing that this is a different pace and mode of storytelling, that 
the oyster scene in the show, in the book it functions as um, it's a payoff of sexual tension that's been building for 80 pages. But here, it's what hooks her. It's the first taste, and it's her decision, can I have another to stay, even though she's had the first day from hell. Um, and that was a lesson, actually. And we'll show you another, another, we'll give you another taste of, of <laughs> what these characters look oh like after work. Um, Everyone does that. I'll give you a taste. <laughs> the sweet bitter. The food puns never stop. You, you no, know what's funny? Is I'm like, not I, above a pun. I literally, I mean, you guys will tell you that um, so much of, you know, I was so worried about the food stuff. Like, I didn't want this to be the food show, you know, so every time, you know, right? Like, I was always trying to be like, we have to talk about this, like, not just as it relates to food, as it relates to, you know, but there's a lot of wine and a lot of oysters and a lot of... Can't resist. <laughs> All right, we'll run to the third clip, please. Sasha. Come on, let's go. If you need to go, it's fine. You don't? They're going to home bar. Don't let it bother you. It doesn't. I'm used to being alone. Me too. Good hey, night, Howard. Changelings. Good night, Howard. Smoke. Good night, Howard. Yes? I have a meeting tomorrow at 3. Can you come in early? Go over the reservation book, Becky. Of course. Perfect. Mm. You're walking home? I am. Can I walk with you? Of course. Mm -hmm. Enjoy your evening. Thank you, Samal. Good night. What the fuck you doing, huh? I need you. I don't know, just stay here. I don't understand. It's so simple. Four words. Uncle Mark says hi. Who is Uncle Mark? Hold it. Oh, uh. Shit, my wallet. I don't... Hey, the whole solution in a restaurant. As bonito for a new smooth land. Thank you. You speak Spanish? Why wouldn't I? Well, you're Russian. I'm everything, honey. Vivian, two. Seriously? No. She does know her. Fuck off. Is this home bar? Yes. And everyone is here. <sighs> Evening, girl. All the cocaine comes out of there. Empire Bistro, old queens who got fat and have no sphincter muscles left. Cucina, where they have baby brain pasta, whatever the fuck. And they whip women. Mm -hmm. And that is Sophia, hostess at Cucina. That beast vagina knows where my wife is. <laughs> your what? Check this. You, you, you're married? Ginger. Love of my life. Paid her thousand bucks to marry me for the green card, and she's gone. Gone where? That's what you're for. What can I do? Just tell Sophia. Uncle Mark says hi. She will love that. She will think you're friends of Ginger's. 
Then ask where Ginger is. Huh? Ginger is your wife? Oh, you brain surgeon. When I moved here, I ate M&M's for five days and thought I'll die and rats will eat my face. Now I'm a fucking millionaire. That's why I love America and I don't want to go back. Okay. Okay, I can do this. People talk to me. Yes. Okay. Tell us about this actor who plays that role. He's great. Oh, my God. So there's a character in the book named Sasha who is a beautiful Russian backwaiter who just talks shit to Tess nonstop but is the only character who re really doesn't want anything from her. And we saw a ton of tapes. And there are a lot of people out there that can do great Russian accents, and Stu knows most of them from working on the Americans. <laughs> and when I saw Daniar, one name, his name's Daniar, there's no, you can go on IMDb, that's it. I thought, you were born to do this. He came to America on asylum six years ago. He is so thoroughly Russian and added, and so empathetic, and has such an incredible face. It's like a Michelangelo painting. I, I'm, I'm obsessed with him, obviously. Um, but I thought, this is the role for you. This, I'm, you were born to do this. <laughs> and as you're introducing these, introducing these other characters, we're going to wrap up here with just a couple more questions, and then we'll have a Q&A with everybody in the audience. Um, I'm just curious, as you're pl plotting out these six episodes, and you're trying to figure out what you're setting up, theoretically for next season. If this is you know, the six episodes that set up the story to kind of prologue, what, are you, what kind of things are you putting into motion? What are you most interested to put into motion? So we haven't talked about future seasons yet as a team. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, the big thing, these six episodes were gonna be, um, when, when you get hired at a restaurant like this, I learned, um, <laughs> you do not get hired. You get um, asked to train Right, and you have to train for two weeks um, to even get offered the actual job. And so we decided to make this season, these six episodes, those two weeks, right? Um, can Tess survive this training and get the actual offer of the job? And as you see, like, you know, um, <clears throat> this uh, clip you just saw is, is so much about um, her just trying to fit in all these characters, like no one's welcoming, you know, and in this episode, Sasha is just taking advantage of her. Um, you know, no one knows her, and she doesn't know them. And I think every story we tried to tell, and you guys should talk a bit about this, but for me, it was about identity. You know, you come to New York, and you try to, you know, she didn't come here. I always loved about this character that she's not aspirational. You know, it's not like in Girls. She didn't come to New York to be a writer, be an actor. She just came to New York. She just no, you know, she just wanted to come here and wanted to. She landed a job in the restaurant as a place to wait until she figures out what she's going to do, and so really through each of these people, she's learning a bit about herself and and her ability to sort of crack this world and crack these people and not get taken advantage of and and feel lust over love and try new things and 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 try to take her first step into adulthood. Um, that, that, that was the train we tried to sort of follow through each episode. Um, and then we also just, there were things we just liked in the book that we wanted to include. I mean, Simone's apartment. Yes. I mean, that was a big... Yeah. I also think with, like, Sasha is prominent in episode two and prominent again in episode five. And I do think the goal with a show like this, its longevity lives in being able to go home with any of the characters and have them be equally as compelling as Tess. And so we are setting the groundwork for that in the future. It's actually one of the things I like about this show is that it, it really, you can, it, it feels very romantic about New York and it seems to me that's a really dangerous thing to do. Like we've all seen movies that just get New York so wrong. It's sort of easy to make fun of New York, but I, I think, you know, to satirize it, harder to, I think, really get at 
that you, that optimism, that way you feel when you're 22 years old and moving to the city. Um, were your discussions in the writers' room? I'd be curious to maybe hear a few of you talk about how do you get New York right in a show like this. Well, I think it's part of what we've been saying about how people come here to reinvent themselves, and it's about identity, and everybody. Uh, is projecting a very strong sense of their identity, I think, in New York. And I think um, the fun thing about Tess, especially in the book, is that she's so she's such a keen observationalist. Is that a word? <laughs> yeah. um, observer, <laughs> sure. Observational. It's a. It's apparently a profession. You're, you're a writer. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> I made up a word. Um, yeah, she's so keen in her observations, and to me, uh, there was something about her that was almost like a detective. Um, as she comes into this world and she's an outsider and there's already so many relationships that are in place and so many, you know, people have friendships, people have enemies, people, and she's trying to figure out everyone. And I think that's a big part of New York. Like, it's already happening. You're not, you're not coming and saying, ta-da, I've, I've arrived. Like, no one cares. Like, <laughs> you know, you just have to sort of it's hard to make friends. It's really hard to penetrate people. But at the same time, if you're somebody who's good at observing, it's probably the best place to be because there's constantly, you know, uh, things to figure out about people. Yeah, so and I, I think know. you also get New York right by having a lot of images of people consuming things in mass, <laughs> right? Because isn't that what this whole city is about? You know, it's just like about people eating together and putting things inside of themselves together. It got to the point where like, I would go to like restaurants and be like, wow, the art department really got it right for this place, you know? <laughs> like, 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 I think that's New York. We eat. Right? We did, this, this quick aside, we did a big scene, I think in episode four, which is the one with the Chinese restaurant. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Ken grew up in and around the Chinese restaurant. Uh, we, we did a big scene in Chinatown where the entire cast is at a dinner in Chinatown and having a a blast, and then the day we're shooting it, like we're setting up this gigantic thing in a restaurant, and Stephanie and I are like, we got some time to kill, let's go get some Chinese food. And we walk into like the nicest Chinese restaurant in Chinatown, and there's Ken Lin eating. <laughs> <laughs> I actually work there also, that's still my day job. It's your staff meal. Consumer, just, yeah. Um, as far as getting New York right, I think that my go-to move was to ask Liz, <laughs> I say what? No. Yes. And what did she um, say? Well, Liz, I think you have to first be like, New York City is the fifth character of the show. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, no, I mean, that's very nice. But no, I think what they led us to is that you just kept it very small. I mean, you kept it about this group of people. You kept it about this restaurant. You kept it about the one bar that everyone goes to. And I think that's actually New York. And that's actually everybody's experience of New York, is this little... Uh, coven or group of people, tribe, that find each other. And it's not about like the big epic scenes of the Staten Island Ferry. It's about the restaurant, the bar, the walk to the bar, you know. So that's what I think they yeah, did. Yeah, look, had, had we made this on a network like, you know, that demanded it, right? You, the end of the pilot would be she's accepted. And the reality of New York is like, you never totally feel it. I mean, right? I mean, you never feel totally accepted. But but the, also the reality is, if you came to New York, you probably don't care <laughs> all the way no. about being accepted. Yeah. I mean, you're used to being alone. She's from used Brooklyn, to, I, and she's I always trying like, to get to Manhattan. It's <laughs> so so like, just a bridge away. Uh, it's like a bunch of orphans trying to figure out how to be a family. No, I remember when I was really, really struggling, which was for like a decade or two, um, and like somebody would be like, hey, let's go on a vacation. I'll pay for it. I'm like, I can't lose my foothold in New York, man. Two weeks? I'm going to be I'm gonna be so behind. Are you kidding me? Like, I couldn't do it. I was afraid I was going to miss something, and I would have, probably. <laughs> anyway, I'm so glad that's over now. I'm getting so stressed out. I know. Uh, New Yorkers are intense. <laughs> we'll, we'll, uh, we'll open it up some questions. We're going to pass along a microphone. Um, you raise your hand. How about right here? Oh. Hi there. Um, so, so, you talked a little bit about how you had to let go of um, the book, and figure out how to write it as a TV show. So one, how do you well, like how did everybody else help you let go? And also what are like can you talk a little bit more about that process? Yeah, I'm gonna tell in 
a true anecdote from the first day of, as opposed to a fictional anecdote. I'm very clear on these things, you guys. Um, the first day in the writer's room, and we were kind of going through the major characters, and someone was like, oh, Jake, he's the most boring character in the book, am I right? And everyone's like, oh, yeah, snooze, hot bartender. Like, we've seen this a million times, and I was like, okay, cool. <laughs> these, these people are really cool. And then Ken said, we could make him unavailable, like really emotionally unavailable. And I was like, oh, wow, how? And he said, well, he could be HIV positive. And I, he was completely serious. I will never live this down, by the way. I will and never, I, ever. And I said, this is a bad pitch. I don't, think he, I don't think he said that. He did, he did. And he was like, we really need to see more HIV positive, like, people in media. And he, like, had this full pitch. And I was like, oh, my God, am I supposed to say yes to this? Oh, my God. Like, okay, well, it's a little bit of a departure from the original book. On day one. <laughs> like, sweating. And then I was like, so maybe not that direction yet. <laughs> and I think that that applies to every single crazy pitch, my own crazy pitch included, is we heard everything, everything was on the table, and at the end of the day, it had to fit with the tone of the book. Um, it didn't have to be exactly from the book, but it had to be believable that it was from this world. And I'm not saying that Jake will not become HIV positive. It might happen, but... Uh, we did have a rule. I mean, it, we did, you know, from the beginning. And it's always funny, like, to um, sit uh, at the table, you know, at, uh, in the writer's room, and someone's pitching something, and you just see Stephanie's face kind of, like, contort, <laughs> right? <laughs> like, like, you know, that's a pretty big departure from the book. But we really did, at the end of the day, if there was an idea that um, did not... Uh, was not true to the spirit of the book, um, and she didn't feel comfortable with it, we did not go with it, you know. That was a really bold day one pitch, Ken. I loved it. <laughs> I was like, For the rest of the writers, some people are like, okay, this is a really bad pitch. It's not as bad as the HIV pitch. <laughs> <laughs> We'll do another question. But I, but I would, I, 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 I will say that I never ever, what you guys are talking about, I never felt it. Like I was, like Stephanie felt like, yeah. established this she was tone a good, that she, she yeah, she was the baker. writer in the room. Like I never got yeah. the sense that really we ever, specific. we were only rewarded. Um, I don't feel rewarded right now, but um, <laughs> we were only ever rewarded for, for trying to open the box further, you yeah. know? And uh, I, I remember going home and being like, I don't know how I, I wouldn't be able to do that. Yeah. Right. It was really remarkable. Over here. Just as a follow-up, can you guys talk about what it was like to be in the room together? Did you always work together? Did you split up into groups? Did you do episodes together? How did that work? And then also a second question is just in casting your lead, did you find that you had to modify your what you had envisioned for your character? And what was that process like when you actually had real people playing these parts that you had cast in your head for so long? Stu, do you want to talk a little bit how you, you ran the room? How we worked? Um, yeah, I mean, I, um, I have this sort of having been in a lot of rooms and, and, and uh, when I run a room, I, um, you know, I think <laughs> that you want to get the best out of the group, and to me, that means not spending that much time in the room. We also were casting, building the set, doing a lot of things while we, it all had to happen at once, because we were going so fast. But, um, you know, for me, my biggest thing is about hiring people, um, even if I don't know them, I have a feeling that I trust, um, or I, and I, I like their writing, and I like, um, you know, it's funny, like, we were just watching this clip, and, um, you know, that whole thing, um, uh, uh, the beast vagina, uh, what, what's her name? Um, Uncle Mark. Uncle Mark. Tell her Uncle Mark says hi, right? We could not break, like, I will spend time in the room. I feel like there's, there's always, like, a time where the room goes too far and we're never going to figure something out. It's time to break it, right? But, you know, uh, we're never in there for more than two hours at a time, where, you know. But we could not break 
like there was an engine for story two, for episode two that just it didn't have it, you know? And one day I was just like, I said to Ken, like, do me a favor, just, we just board something, you know, and we had writers of different levels and we had a couple of very young writers and we were off, Liz was on script and we were in casting and I just said to Ken, like, do me a favor, bud, like, and we've never worked together before, we're a month into working together, but I just, can you just try and board something with the writers, like, that is some propulsive story that could go, and literally I walked into the room a couple hours later and he had the fucking thing beat it out in like nine beats and Uncle Mark says hi and, <laughs> and, and she hits, like, and I was like, dude, I hugged him, you know? <laughs> because that's the thing, like as a showrunner, there's so much to do and when the people that you are working with um, take the initiative to, you know, push things along, you feel incredibly grateful. I realize, by the way, nobody got the payoff to that. So it cuts no, off yeah, before you get the payoff. Good. But there's a huge yeah. payoff to that, that sequence. Well, as Stu is looking at Ken's masterpiece, it, he's like, Uncle Mark? Who's Uncle Mark? We're like, keep reading, keep reading. <laughs> <laughs> does he have um, eight? Right. Yeah. Meanwhile, it's all, it's all penmanship. All right, <laughs> if there's any secret that I can give to any burgeoning writer is to work on your penmanship, because then they're just like, oh, I can read it. <laughs> all right, let's do it. <laughs> but, I mean... The process of our room, it was so much dictated by the really, really smart people we had in it. Um, you know, it was really, it was, it was, it was a great, you know, and we, did, we did not do a lot of group writing. We had one night where we like had one scene to figure out. But really like I, I believe in, you know, you break a story, don't break that much detail, give it to the writer, let them go off and do their job, bring it back and, um, you know, we have, um, we, we hired some very funny people, including, where's Luke Sands? Wave, wave your hand, wave your hand. Um, who came to us from Saturday Night Live um, and was our writer's assistant and would pitch jokes. And, you know, um, so at the end, we would sort of all get together on it, but really it's people's episodes are their episodes. I also have to say, um, and I don't like complimenting Stu, but I'm going to, which is that I've been, you know, you hear terrible stories about writers' rooms with crazy showrunners that they like to, you know, they hate their, they hate their personal lives, so they keep them there until midnight, and they're all completely disorganized, and it's a nightmare, and that's a lot of the times you hear these stories. But Stu was so, I was really, I learned a lot, he was so surgical, like he would come in and he'd say, okay, we're going to take 15 minutes to talk about the third scene that we can't get right, and we're like, okay, or like we're going to take two hours to talk about, you know, the world of the restaurant and the theme or whatever, but he, it was always very organized. And I always thought, well, we can't possibly come up with something in 15 minutes. And like, we, we really usually did. And it was really such a good lesson on how efficient you can be, you know, obviously with brilliant writers, but also just <laughs> the way you let it was really, you don't have to spend, I mean, you do have to spend a lot of time, but not as much time as you think or people do. I, so I never had that rubber room feeling, yeah. right? When you're like, we're here. Except for that oh God. Except for that scene right there where we couldn't get it. But yes, no. No, the rubber room of like, why are we still here? And do we really um, have to order dinner? And the other something? answer, the other thing that, um, to your other question, um, you know, we were trying to cast the lead and we were looking on, you know, on like four continents. I mean, we were like, we were, we had casting directors all over the world looking. And we were looking at a lot of petite blonde women, we, you know. Um, uh, I wonder why. And we literally, you know, um, and one day this, this self-tape, we put a casting director on in London that I trust, that I know that, um, and she sent the tape and she said, take a look at this. And, and I mean, really, she didn't do it that well, but just like when that person looked at the camera and started to talk, it gave us, and you should talk about this, because it really gave us, um, it, we were like, that could be Tess. And, um, and it meant changing certain elements from tests from the book. But when you, you know, I said, Steph, like, when you put a show on its feet, you take it out of the book and you put it on its feet, it's, it's one thing to call a character in the book a blank slate. Because you can write in their head about what they're seeing, you know. But when you put it on its feet, like, no person is a, no real person is a blank slate. You know, someone comes from somewhere, they're inexperienced, but that's not blank. You know, you never tasted something you know, like an oyster, like, again, that's, it's more dimensional. And so we, we start to think about the actor, like, it can be a lot, you know, Ella, our lead actress, had more backstory just to her face than the character did in the book. And we start to talk about, that could be a good thing, you know. Another question right over here. 
Hi. Um, I'm really curious about the main character. Uh, I didn't read the book, so she's someone who is coming into a new world. She's an innocent, um, you could call her the fish out of water. Um, and she comes to New York, which is a very strong city, and there are very strong personalities all around her. And you also called her an observer. So how do you, how does, what's the challenge for a writer to get such a character to drive the story? Um, it's a con it's a constant challenge because she's being acted upon most of the time and in the book that's how she's written she is she's the eyes to the world and she's watching but that's a passive state and you have to make her more dynamic i think like at a micro level giving her smaller wants than I want to become a person, which is a great want, but it's an existential journey and it's not one that plays well over 30 minutes of television. Um, getting into the sort of, the small wants, like I want to survive this night. I want to make one, I want to make one friend. I want to get a three plate carry down. All of those stories are in service of the larger existential journey but they're more compelling to watch on television, and none of them are really in the book. Yeah, the one that isn't micro is I want to belong. Yeah. You know, like the, the, the sort of like find your tribe thing, you know, you talk, like is such a primal thing, and, and it's why, you know, every time we talk about the show to people, we talk about, oh, well, she's 22, and she's come to New York, she's a young woman. Um, they do think that for all the characters at any age, I, I don't think there's a specific age that people find their tribe. I think some people find it 30, some people find it 40, you know, um, Liz found it when she came to our show. I mean, <laughs> it, it, um, I think that, and I think that's a big want, you know, and, and I think for us, again, you couldn't do it on a network show, but on a cable show, um, you, that, that, that was our engine. Any questions on the back? I can, can't quite see back there, but yeah, right here on the aisle. Uh, he's not, I mean, he, he could be, like, he would dabble, I'm sure. Um, everyone else is into cocaine. I mean, Jake would do cocaine. Are you saying oysters is a gateway drug to cocaine? I can't hear, I can't hear. What but, oysters no? have you been having? very high on life. I thought maybe. Like, yeah, well, considering is. his potential medical history, he's probably a heroin addict, right? <laughs> <laughs> Let go of it, Ken. So Let go. NBC. So NBC. We do have uh, we do have a character who, uh, uh, in episode two, uh, introduces test of cocaine. Um, so we have. If you're looking for that. If you're yeah, looking. don't worry, you guys. The cocaine. That's your coming. bag. Looking for a good coke show. Right. A question over here, please. Thank you. Hi. Uh, so. I feel that when you know books are translated into film or television, you kind of lose a lot of the internal dialogue that the main character has. And in Sweet Bitter, I felt like when I was reading, there wasn't even much of that when we were reading. Like again, Tess is a very present tense character, and like even when she um, says her name for the first time, it's like toward the end of the book, and like I read back a few pages, and I'm like, is that the first time I'm hearing her name? So um, I wanted to know how you went on this journey of like translating her into television and how like you don't lose that empathy along the way and how people can still identify her without that like internal dialogue that she has. Yeah, it, that was difficult because for those that have read the book, the quality of Tess's thoughts let us know that she's a serious and intelligent person. The things that come out of her mouth are like, um, I don't know, I'm sorry, it, she's a 22-year-old girl and she hasn't learned how to articulate herself yet. And so it's a balance. First of all, you have to have the right actress who can tell you whole entire st novels with her eyes um, because that is going to give you the gravity. If you can feel that there's more to her, people are underestimating her. That's not something we can really write into the show. Um, 
And then beyond that, it's being very careful with her dialogue so that we know that she's seen more than we think she's seen. But it was a big, I mean, your question is, it was great. I mean, there were, we all had passages from the book that we wanted to find a way to get into the show. You know, stuff that would not be dialogue. Right. You know, um, and we, we tried. I mean, there were things that there, you know, we really tried to sort of find, and there were certain characters that could talk more the way the book was written, like Simone. You know, um, Liz wrote episode four, which is a, literally a passage from the book that um, a whole section of the book about Tessa's first day off, and she spends the whole day in Simone's apartment. And um, there's a lot, there, there were a fair number of things from the book that you really loved that you tried to... No, I feel like uh, it's almost some of it was like completely sp very lifted directly from the book. And it, yeah, it does feel like it's one of the episodes that feels very faithful to the book. We have time for one more question right here on the aisle, please. Thank you. We'll get you a mic. So um, one question I had was the book takes place in 2006, I think, which also sparks a lot of, you know, romanticism, and it's all about the old New York, and it's constantly evolving. So 2006. No, I know. Way it's back then. Old. <laughs> in the olden days. Well, <laughs> but you know what I mean. It's true. It's a little bit older. So is the show, take? does it take place in present times? Do you... Do you still have that sort of nostalgia feeling of not old New York, but older New York? This show takes place in 2006. You um, are looking at the first 2006 period piece. Maybe not the, <laughs> maybe not the first. It's probably like the eighth. But um, we were really serious about it. The cars, the kitchen equipment, um, any periodicals, all the music. Everything is 2006. It was specific. so nice to write a character that didn't have a smartphone. Well, that's what it's, so it's cool. really, it's, it is really pre-technology, and that actually is a huge difference. So it actually is a period piece because there's a lot of things you, you couldn't and didn't do, it was, and it was great. It goes we to an internet cafe. Yeah, she does. <laughs> we spent a day in the room, a day, talking about what if it were now. And the truth is, is um, it, you couldn't do this show the way we did it because so much of what um, this show is about the nature of experience, right? The first time you try something, the first time you go somewhere. Um, Tess could not come to New York with a smartphone. She would, she would know the, what the restaurant is from Instagram and, and, and she would you know, not be alone. You're not alone anymore because you're connected to a million things. You know, we, we do a million scenes in our restaurant set by the bar. If you walk into Babo, Right now, everyone's at the bar looking at their phones, and no one is experiencing life the way you did in 2006. You had to actually experience it yourself. You couldn't experience it through someone else's account, right? And, um, and, and, and that is one of the most fundamental things about our show. I mean, um, she is an observer, and she has to go through it herself. Um, and I think the stakes are, are caught up in that. I think it's a great way to end this. I, I was, I was a, a New York Magazine editor in 2006. I worked on our Reasons to New York issue. I edited it. And here are a couple of our Reasons to Love New York that I thought were straight, like ripped straight from this show. Um, because of the streets at dawn. Because of our gorgeous waiters. <laughs> because of pork. <laughs> because we have hot dates. Because of our desserts. And because we can be defiantly deluded. <laughs> anyway, thank you all for coming. Somebody want to say you. how you can see this show very soon? Is it going to be a Tribeca? Do we know what day oh. it's premiering? Wait. Get stars. Get, that's what I'm supposed to say. Yeah. Get stars or the on app. The, app. the app. There's an app. May 6th. Yes. Yes to stars Thank you app. all. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for thank coming. You.